Hey everybody, I'm Mike Wardinsky and today I'm going to show you how to shoot and process star trails. In this video, I'll cover best practices, shooting modes, intervalometers, focusing, processing, and more. If you enjoy the video, don't forget to check out naturemike.com for in-field astrophotography workshops and more. Now in the days of film, you would just use a cable release to open your exposure for an hour or two or, or longer and then let go. But with digital, things are a little different because instead of film, we have sensors and sensors get hot. And as sensors get hot, they start to produce noise. So what we're actually gonna do is take a series of shorter exposures and blend them together in Photoshop. But before we get there, let's talk about the gear that we need. The first thing you're gonna need is a DSLR or mirrorless camera. Full frame is ideal because the sensor is larger and can collect more light, resulting in a cleaner image but a crop sensor can and will work. You just won't have as clean of an image when you're done. You'll also need a lens. A wide or mid-range lens is ideal. I like a 16 to 35, that gives you a nice range. Since we're dealing with star trails and not the Milky Way, you don't need to be ultra wide, but a lot of times if you wanna include a lot of sky or get a little bit closer to your subject, you might need to be a little bit on the wider end, like 16 or 20 millimeters. You'll also want a sturdy tripod since you're going to be taking many photos over the course of an hour and you want them all to line up. You want a tripod that's not going to shift in the wind or fall over and you'll also want a nice ball head. The Really Right Stuff BH40 is one of my personal favorites and I'll put some links to some good tripods and ball heads in the description to this video. An intervalometer is essential to star trails. In the days of film, we used to just shoot for an hour or two, and that was it. But with a digital camera, your sensor can get quite hot. So what we want to do is actually take a bunch of short exposures, maybe four to five minute long exposures, and then combine them together afterwards in Photoshop. And I'll show you how to use this thing later on in the video. Now, an L bracket is not required for astrophotography and you definitely don't need it, but it can make your life a little bit easier. In fact, it makes your life a little bit easier for any kind of shooting. It allows you to mount the camera horizontally or vertically on any Arca Swiss style ball head. These brackets are made specifically for individual camera models. So if you're going to buy an L bracket, make sure you get one that's designed to fit on your camera and the more expensive ones do tend to fit a little bit better than the cheap knockoff ones. Since you're gonna be shooting in the dark, a headlamp is absolutely essential so you can see where you're going, see your camera, and if you want to, you can also use it as a light painting tool. This Petzl Actic Core is a 450 lumen. It's what I keep in my camera bag all the time. It's perfect for seeing at night with the red light, and it also allows me to paint really bright white light when I want a light paint. Lastly, warming gels can help warm up your headlamp light. They tend to be a little bit on the cooler side, so a warming gel will help warm up that light. They come in various densities, and, and you can usually get a pack of multiple densities so you can warm the light to your liking. Before you head out to shoot star trails, it's a good idea to make sure you know how to use your intervalometer. If you already know how to use your intervalometer, you can just fast forward through this section. Now, a lot of different companies make these. Um, most of them are more or less the same. The one that you see on the screen here is the most common layout that you'll see. And I do recommend getting one that looks like this. And I'll leave a few links down in the description of this video. Keep in mind, each camera manufacturer and model might have a different remote port. So make sure you get an intervalometer that's designed to work with your camera. At the top of the device, you notice a couple of words. You have delay, long, interval, and, and a musical note. So delay is the amount of time before the camera actually starts to shoot. So this is just like the delay on your camera, like the two second or the 10 second delay. You could set this for an hour or two or three. Um, and with star trails, you're probably never gonna do that. You're probably always gonna leave this set to zero. One reason to use the delay would be if you wanted to time something out like the Milky Way peeking out over a mountain at a certain time that you didn't want to stay up for. You could set the delay for three or four hours and it would take a shot after that. Next you have long and that's how long the camera is going to shoot for. 
And you can set this anywhere from one second all the way up to a couple of minutes to even a couple of hours. But again, as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, you typically don't want to shoot for more than a couple of minutes because you're going to get a hot sensor and you're going to get a lot of noise. Next you have interval. That's how often the camera takes a shot. And basically you want to minimize that interval because you don't want gaps between your stars. And every model is a little different. On most intervalometers, the minimal interval is one second. Some will go down to zero but most you're going to be at one second and that's totally fine. Next you have N which stands for number. So that's the number of shots which is uh, marked down here in the lower right hand corner of the screen. And you can set this to take one shot, you can set to take 10 shots, um, 99 shots, or sometimes there's even a two dashes which will mean it's just going to take shots until one of your batteries dies. And lastly, the most important thing is the music note. Turn this off, always. If you forget to turn this off, you're gonna have to listen to this. Okay, so moving along, down here we have our numbers. The first set of numbers is going to be hours. The next set of numbers is going to be minutes. And lastly, you have seconds. And then again, down to the lower right corner of the screen, is the number of shots that you have programmed. Looking down at the controls of the remote, it's important to note that there's actually two ways to trigger your camera. You have the traditional way of just hitting the shutter. If you just press this button and hold down, it's gonna take a shot until you let go, as long as you're programmed to bulb mode. If you press this down and push up, it will lock the exposure until you click and pull down. So that's one way you could take a long exposure. But typically you don't wanna do that because you don't know how long you're shooting for. So the other way to use this device and the way you're gonna use it most often is to use the start stop button. Don't confuse these two, uh, I've seen it happen. If you don't press the start stop, you're not going to get all the settings that you just programmed in right up here. So that's how you start these settings, and that's also how you stop them. If you press this and push up, it's just gonna keep on counting and it's never gonna stop until you run out of battery. So the way you change between these top settings is simply by using the little control pad down here. If you push to the right, this black bar will move to long. If you push again, it's gonna go to interval, the number, and then of course, the music note. If you wanna make an adjustment to any one of these settings, you move the bar, press set, and then you can use the up and down arrows to change the actual numbers. So let's go through this. Let's say we want to set up our star trails to shoot for four minutes long. I'm gonna leave my delay set to zero. I'm gonna come down here and click our menu over to long. And now I'm gonna press set and these numbers will start to flash. And I can use this control pad to move between my hours, minutes, and seconds. So I'm gonna navigate over to the minutes by pushing to the right once, and then I will go up four times to get to four minutes. One, two, three, four. Next, I'll navigate over to interval by clicking to the right, and I'll leave this set to one second. And I'll go to the right once more, and I'll click set, and that'll allow me to change this number. Now, assuming I'm shooting at four minutes per shot, and let's say I want to shoot for an hour, um, 15 times four would be 60 minutes. So I'm gonna go ahead and change this to 15 simply by clicking up until I see the number 15 appear right here. And lastly, I'll hit set, and I'll head over to the right one more time to turn off that pesky music note. Here I'll just click up or down until I see the little no smoking sign over the music note, and we're good to go. I should also mention there is a lock button, so you can, you can lock these settings, that way you can't accidentally bump them and you just click and hold this button to do that. If you short click it, it will also illuminate the LCD screen here. Now all we need to do is make sure that our camera settings are set and our intervalometer is plugged in and hit the start button and then let the camera do the dirty work. Shooting at night is a little different than shooting in the day. Your camera's light meter is gonna be absolutely useless to you at nighttime. When it comes to nighttime photography, you're sort of like a mad scientist and you have to experiment a little bit when it comes to camera settings. I'm gonna share with you some good starting point settings for when you're shooting with no moon and when you're shooting with full moon. 
And if you have like a half a moon, you kind of split the difference between these two. Uh, so first off, no matter if you have a full moon or no moon, you're going to change your camera's mode to bulb mode. This is going to allow you to shoot for more than 30 seconds, and it's going to allow you to use the intervalometer to program any amount of time that you like. Whether I have a full moon or a no moon, I typically try and shoot for about four to five minutes. The reason being is I want a long exposure to get those nice trails, but I don't want it to be too long where I start to get a lot of noise. So that four to five minute range tends to be a really good starting point for shutter speed. Now, if you have a full moon, f8 tends to be a pretty good aperture to shoot at. And if you have no moon, you're gonna have to open that aperture up quite a bit to somewhere around f4. During a full moon, I like to shoot around ISO 400. And if there's no moon, I usually shoot somewhere around 500 and sometimes even a little bit higher. And as long as you're shooting in RAW, the white balance doesn't really matter a ton, but I like my photos to come out looking similar to how I want them to look when I'm post-processing. So with no moon, I tend to like a little bit cooler white balances around 3200. And with the full moon, usually right around 4200 Kelvin is a good starting point, or even the sunshine white balance can work really nicely with a full moon. Lastly, before you start shooting, you're going to want to go into your camera's menu and make sure long exposure noise reduction is turned off. Uh, a lot of times it's abbreviated to long exposure NR. So go ahead and make sure you turn that off because if you don't turn that off, your star trails will be ruined because what's going to happen is your camera's going to take an exposure uh, for the amount of time that you tell it to, but then after that, it's going to take another dark frame in order to reduce the noise. And so it actually takes two frames, but one of them's black. And so you're gonna have basically a bunch of dotted lines in your sky if you don't turn that off. So let's talk about focusing in the dark. Your camera's autofocus is not going to work in the dark. So switch your lens to manual, and then we're gonna have to dial in the focus ourselves. So the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna look at the distance window on the body of the lens itself and when we turn it, we should see an infinity sign. That's infinity. That's where we want to be. Now, it might not be completely focused at that point, but it's going to be in the ballpark of where we want to be. Because if you're completely out of focus, you won't be able to see any stars at all. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to zoom in digitally, not using the lens. We're actually going to use the camera and just digitally zoom in. And your camera should have a magnifying glass on the back of it somewhere or somewhere on the body. If it doesn't, you'll have to get your manual out and figure out how to zoom in to the image. So what you need to do is point your camera up at the sky at a bright object, ideally the brightest star you can find up there. We're going to bump up our ISO to around 3200, 4000 or so. We'll open the aperture wide open, f2.8, f4, whatever the maximum aperture is on your lens. And then we're gonna take our shutter speed in manual to 30 seconds. And that's gonna give us as much gain in the image. And it's gonna allow us to see the brightest stars in the sky. And when we rack that, that focus back and forth on the lens, we should see stars either appear or disappear. And you're gonna to want to move that focus until the, the stars become as sharp as they can be. Once you see the star has gone sharp, You've got your focus, and now at this point, be careful not to bump your lens and also not to zoom. You should never change your zoom once you obtain focus. It's a good idea to go through a checklist before you start shooting, and I'll go ahead and place this one in the video description. It's a good idea to plug in your intervalometer before you mount it on the tripod because sometimes it can be difficult to get to that port after the camera's already mounted on the tripod. Make sure that you're shooting in RAW or at the very least RAW plus JPEG. Make sure your battery is 100% charged, especially if you're shooting in cold conditions because these long exposures and cold conditions can really zap a battery quickly. And it's a good idea to bring extras if you have them. Make sure you have enough room on your memory card for all of your shots, especially if you're doing star trails you wouldn't want to run out of space halfway through your sequence. Make sure you have all filters removed from the lens. A UV filter can be okay, 
but if you're shooting around city lights, sometimes weird refractions can happen. With star trails, you probably would be okay with keeping the UV on, but that's your call. Make sure your lens is set to manual focus and turn image stabilization off on the lens and in the camera if either is equipped with it. Don't forget to turn off long exposure noise reduction. Check the camera mode and make sure you're set to bulb for star trails. Set the white balance to your preference. Program your intervalometer and focus on a bright star. Once you go through this checklist, you're ready to shoot. It's always a good idea to do one or two test exposures before you shoot for an entire hour because it would be terrible to find out at the end of that hour that all of your shots are underexposed, overexposed, or out of focus. Now that we've gone over all of our settings, the last thing that we have to do is find the North Star. And this is actually pretty easy. There's a handful of apps out there to help you with this, including the Photographer's Ephemeris, Photopills, and many others. But with a little bit of practice, you can find the North Star with nothing more than your eyes. It's pretty easy to find because all you need to do is find the Big Dipper and once you find the Big Dipper, the last two stars of the ladle actually point to the North Star, which is the handle of the Little Dipper. Now the North Star is actually a pretty faint star, but with a little bit of practice, you'll be able to find it with no trouble at all. You don't need to always include the North Star in your composition. Just because it's there doesn't mean you have to include it. If your composition would be better without it, then don't try and force it. Okay, so I've uploaded my photos into Lightroom and now I need to do a few basic edits before we create our star trail. So I'm gonna go ahead and select the first photo and I'm going to shift click on the last photo. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want to give them all a color label. That way I can easily recognize them and know that they're supposed to be blended together. So if you don't see this toolbar down in the bottom of your screen, go ahead and hit the T key. And if you don't see these icons, come to the far right side and turn on sorting, flagging, rating, color label, and rotate. And so I'm going to come over here and I'm going to hit red and that's going to turn the outside box of all these images red. That way I know they're all supposed to be blended together. And it doesn't matter if it's nighttime or HDR or a pano. That's just my system to know. Like if I click on this, like, oh, I, I know that this is supposed to go with another photo. So I'm going to click on the first one and I'm going to go into the develop module by hitting the D key. And we're going to go down to lens corrections. I'm going to check remove chromatic aberration and enable profile corrections. Now sometimes with nighttime photography, uh, since we're shooting at such a high ISO and it's so dark, you can get a lot of noise when, it, um, when you do the profile corrections. So a lot of times you actually have to come down to the vignette slider and drag it back down, maybe somewhere in the middle. And that's usually pretty good. Um, next, we're, we're going to adjust our white balance. It looks pretty good to me right now. I'm just going to see what happens if I move it in one direction or the other. If we wanted a little more neutral sky, I could kind of warm, warm it up here. Maybe something like that. And sometimes you get a little bit of green in the sky. And so I'm going to go to my color tab and see if I notice any adjustments by moving the green hue and hue slider. Don't really see anything. I'm just going to take that saturation down a bit. What about the yellows? Not seeing a ton there. And the aquas, I'm going to check this out. So the aquas, I'm, I'm definitely getting a little bit of color cast there. And so I'm going to take that aqua and actually drag it towards the blue just to kind of neutralize the, the sky a little bit more and kind of make it one even color. Um, and I'm going to come down to detail and I'm going to reduce the noise by maybe like 30. That way, if there's any sort of noise happening, it will be minimized. If you notice splotches of color in the image, that's color noise. And you can use the color noise slider to help reduce that. This image, I'm not noticing a ton, so I won't use it. But there have been times where I've taken it all the way to the end. And this is one of the few sliders in Lightroom you can sometimes push pretty hard and not have too much of a negative effect on the overall image. Our white balance looks good. 
Um, it's a nice dark sky, so I don't want to brighten it up too much. Sometimes the whites can help the stars pop a little bit. Um, but it will lighten a little when we go into Photoshop and stitch these all together. And sometimes I'll also add just a pinch of clarity. Let's do about 12 here. And now we need to synchronize these settings with the rest of the images we shot. So I'm going to hit the G key to go back to the grid view. We have our first one selected. I'm going to shift click on the bottom. And now I'm going to hit sync. So something happened here, and this is actually a good example. So I'm in the library module. So this is asking if I want to sync the metadata. That's not what I want to do. I want to go into the develop module now that these are all selected, which I could have done in the film strip down here. And I'm just going to hit sync, check all, and then synchronize. And these settings from this one image are going to sync across the rest. Now we can bring these into Photoshop. So I'm going to control click, edit in, open as layers in Photoshop. That way they all come into the same document. If we went to edit in Photoshop, they'd all open up into their own separate tabs and it'd be kind of a, a mess to get them all into the one document. So we want to open as layers in Photoshop. Once Photoshop opens, it's going to bring in each layer individually and it'll take a minute. So I'll fast forward this. Okay, so all my photos came into Photoshop here and here they are. Before I mess with them, the first thing I'm going to do is go to my history window and hit the little camera icon to create a snapshot. That way I can always get back to this point without having to re-import everything. If you're new to Photoshop, I do have a great video on how to set up the Photoshop workspace. And you can check that out in the link in the upper right corner of the screen right now. Okay, so to create star trails, it's actually really easy to do. All we need to do is select our top layer, scroll down to the bottom and shift click so they're all selected. Then we need to come up to our blend mode where it says normal. We'll click on that and there's a lot of options and we're going to go down to lighten. And what that's going to do is it's going to bring all of the bright pixels to the top of the stack. And since the stars are moving, we get star trails. So let's do that. Let's go down to lighten. And there we go. We have a nice set of star trails, but you also see that we have a lot of airplanes going through the sky and that's pretty common, but we can address that. And let's try and find this, this big one right here. So I'm going to scroll down to the bottom and what I'm going to do is just start turning these layers on and off until I see that airplane streak disappear. Okay. So there it was. It's on layer seven, five, eight, two. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a layer mask here and nothing's changed yet. And I need to choose my brush and I'm going to shrink it down by holding the left bracket key. And I want it to be about the same size as that airplane path. So maybe right about there. And right now white selected. So I'm going to switch this to black. So I'm going to come up to the top of the line where the airplane starts. I'm going to click once and then I'm going to shift click down on the bottom. And that's going to draw a black line across that entire airplane path, effectively erasing it. And I'll show you what the mask look like, looks like by holding option here. As you can see, it just drew that black. And so just erase just this section of the, uh, the image of this image. And so that's what you can see what I just did. And I'm not going to take care of all of these because that would take a lot of time. Um, for this video, but if you're going to be showing your photos or printing them, I highly recommend that you take the time and erase any sort of artifacts like airplanes going through the sky. Now this is a pretty nice shot, but it's just a silhouette. So it's a little, you know, boring right now because the rock's not that interesting as a silhouette. So we could have added some light painting shots. In fact, I did take some out here and I took quite a few because this is a really big rock and big area to, to light up. So I'm going to go ahead and import those right now and fast forward. All right. So I have a few of my light painted layers here in Photoshop. And if I turn them off, you can kind of see how I painted the rock with light in a couple of different areas. And we can no longer see our star trails. And that's because all we're seeing is this top layer because it's blend mode is set to normal. 
But just like we did with the star trails, we can also blend our light with the light in blend mode. So I'm gonna go ahead and shift click on the bottom layer to select all my layers, all my light painted layers. And I'm gonna to come to my blend mode and I'm just gonna change this to lighten. And that's allowing us to see all of the light painting here as well as the star trails. Now there are a few problems. I was actually in the shot and you can see my flash over here. So we need to get rid of that. So just like we did with the airplanes, we need to find out which layer it's on. And there it is. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on this layer, add a layer mask, and nothing's changed now because we have a white mask. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna choose our brush and we're gonna paint black onto this mask to erase these spots. And I'm gonna zoom in here. And I need to be careful because if I turn this layer on and off, you can see all of this light down here is coming from this layer. So not only is this flash here, but so is all this other fill light. So I need to be really careful and use a small brush here. Because if I just kind of go to town here, let me show you what happens. I start erasing that light. And we don't want to do that. We just want to kind of hide this. So I'm going to take my opacity down to maybe about 50% just so I can increase my chances of this blending nicely. And shrink my brush to about the size of that. And I'm just gonna click here a couple of times until it kind of goes away. And right about there is good. And we'll do the same thing right here. And over here, I'll increase the size a little bit. And that looks pretty good. And we'll come in here. Now this one, we're, we're having a little bit bigger of a problem. It's just too much of a difference between, because the background's solid black. And so if I erase this, it just becomes black. So what we're gonna have to do is just sort of give the illusion that this was part of the shadow too. So I'll increase my brush size and just sort of feather this in a little bit. Maybe take it down to 30% now. And I think that's looking pretty good. And I can turn that mask on and off so you can see the before and after. Okay, so that's good. Now the one issue we need to uh, address here is when I add these light painted shots, I also add pinpoint stars into the sky. And you can see a couple of them up here. Here's a few, a couple more. And so we need to mask those out. Now the easiest way to do this is if you take a shot before it gets completely dark, you'll have a light sky and it's very easy to use the quick selection tool. And even though we don't have a light sky, we're gonna try it anyway. But I need to make sure that I select one of these layers that has a bright sky here. Um, so I'm gonna try this one. I'm gonna use my quick selection tool. And we're gonna see how well this does. It actually looks like it's working out pretty nicely for us. That's perfect, that's all we need. It doesn't have to be a detailed mask because all we're doing is masking out the sky of this light painted area. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all of these layers, all of these light painted areas, layers, all these light painted layers, and put them into a single folder. That way we can apply just one mask to this folder that has all of these images in it. So now we have our selection made. I'm gonna go ahead and hit the layer mask icon. And now the opposite of what we wanted to happen has happened. And that's because we made our selection in the sky, not the foreground. But it's really easy to fix this. We're just gonna go to our layer mask and we're gonna hit Command I on a Mac or Control I on a PC. And you can see all of those little pinpoints went away. Uh, the only dots we have in the sky are left over from the airplanes that I didn't do. And I noticed I still have that mask turned off. So I'm gonna open up this folder and I will shift click on the mask and that will turn it back on. Okay, so the image is looking pretty good. And in the final image, I did do a lot more light painting and I did fill it in and I'll show you that at the end of the video. Um, the only thing I would continue doing here is removing these airplanes um, using layer masks down in these star trail layers below. Um, and I would get rid of some of these hot pixels. So to do that, I'm gonna add a new layer. Try to make sure it's up on the top. And we wanna choose our spot healing brush. If your spot healing brush isn't here, sometimes you gotta click and, and navigate to it right here. And then you wanna change your blend mode to normal. Type is set to content aware, and you wanna make sure you set this to sample all layers. And then you can just click on the little hot spots. Zoom in can help. 
And I'm not going to go through all these right now, but I just want to show you how that works. Command zero takes us back to our full screen here. And so this is the work in progress. And this is the final image with all of my light painting blended in. So that's it. We covered a lot in this video, but if you watch the whole video from start to finish, you have all the tools you need to make some incredible star trail photographs. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. And don't forget to check out naturemike.com for more how-to articles and in-field workshops where I demonstrate light painting techniques and much more. See you in the next video.